This video was brought to you by the TLDR store. Get 15% off our pin badges by using code ELECTION. Represent your country and support the channel by clicking the link below. Speaking of 15%, that's about the proportion of our audience who live in the UK. That means a decent chunk of you live in a country that focuses on producing governments with strong working majorities from a single party, and that fears coalitions. And when I say fears, I really mean it. That might sound weird to viewers in Europe, but the British media really loves to create fear around coalitions, with former Prime Minister Theresa May even using the jibe coalition of chaos to try and discourage people from voting for Labour. But of course, countries can operate with a system of government whereby coalitions are regularly formed. So in this video, we're going to outline how European countries make coalitions work, despite the problems that scare away British voters. First though, it's actually worth acknowledging that even the UK has had coalitions, as recently as 2010 to 2015. However, this coalition government demonstrated some of the biggest criticisms that people have with this type of governance. When the coalition was agreed to, the UK had two separate and in many cases opposing parties ruling the country. This could create some, well, difficult situations when trying to create policies. What if, for example, both parties wanted to do something very different? Well, as the Liberal Democrats demonstrated, the junior party usually have to compromise their principles, which doesn't always sit too well with voters. Think of tuition fees, for example. Liberal Democrats promising, we will scrap unfair university tuition fees so everyone has a chance to get a degree regardless of their parents' income, didn't exactly go to plan, and the Liberal Democrats ended up voting to triple tuition fees alongside the Conservatives. Their voters weren't sympathetic either, and they went from 57 seats in 2010 to a measly 8 in 2015. Additionally, it seems that voters simply dislike the dynamic of having two parties in charge. In fact, following five years of coalition, only 29% of voters said that they wanted to be ruled by a coalition again. This was the lowest figure in 30 years. Also, neither party was able to fully enact their manifesto, and the papers often reported on various disagreements within the coalition. So you can see why the UK likes having one group in charge, one group that can make quick decisive decisions, and be held accountable for those decisions. One group who can mould the country according to their manifesto. After all, a coalition is a government that no one voted for. So those are the criticisms. The biggest party can dominate to the detriment of smaller parties. It's easier for the electorate to have just one party in charge. Parties can't always follow their policies, and it's just divisive. So how do European countries make it work, and what can we in the UK learn from them? Well, the first thing to note here is that coalitions take many shapes and forms. For example, you can have a coalition between a very large party and a relatively small one or perhaps a two-party coalition, with the two parties not that different in size. Or you can have a coalition made up of multiple parties. This is an important distinction to make too, because the size of parties is key to understanding the power plays that underpin the coalition. And that's because unstable coalitions tend to emerge from great power imbalances. For example, when a large party is able to extort a very small party. And the large party will become even stronger if it has other options and other parties it could work with if their partner decides not to play ball. At that point, a small party might think that accepting a raw deal is the only way to get at least some of the party's programme into government policy. Another way that a large party might be able to get even more negotiating power is when that large party can afford for coalition talks to collapse. For example, if the UK Conservative Party were to grow so popular that they'd be able to run a government on their own if another election was called. So if coalition talks were to fail, or a new coalition collapses, they could put the blame on the smaller party and drift along with their favourable political momentum and secure an absolute majority in the next election. The reverse can also happen. For example, if a party is very large, but just shy of getting a majority, and there are no alternative small parties for them to go to. This sometimes happens in New Zealand, where the relatively small New Zealand First Party could ask for basically whatever it wanted from the generally much larger Labour and National Parties, who sometimes aren't large enough to form a majority by themselves. 
In all of this, you're probably able to see that it's clear that the election result greatly influences whether you'll be able to get a stable coalition with a healthy balance of power, or whether you'll get the opposite. And the more often you get a bad coalition, the more people will resent the idea of them. As such, the election system heavily influences the quality of coalitions. Systems that create two very large parties and a cluster of smaller ones tend to lead to imbalances of power if there's no outright majority. Imagine, however, your system tends to create a handful of medium-sized parties. Take Germany as an example. In Germany, the current coalition is composed of the Union, with 245 seats, and the SPD, with 152 seats. Clearly, the SPD has very considerable leverage for negotiations, but if negotiations fail, the Union has other parties to go to, but not so many that it can squeeze out the SPD. Also, it's incredibly hard for a political party in Germany to get an absolute majority in the German parliament. So where the Conservatives and Labour have that option in the UK, no party in Germany can feasibly even try to do that. As such, coalitions in Germany tend to be relatively stable, because no party has a disproportionate amount of negotiating power as a result of their electoral system's design. Now, some might argue that yes, it might be good for coalitions to have multiple medium-sized parties, but what happens if your parliament fragments so much that you have an absurd number of parties, none of which are particularly large? Well, this is indeed a risk, and it does in fact happen in some countries. However, a coalition that collapses is not necessarily a bad coalition. Things Sometimes things run very well, with all parties being relatively happy with how things are going until some sort of crisis suddenly hits. Unable to find an agreeable solution, the government then collapses. It'll be easy to label this as a poor coalition, but that'll be to ignore the stability that came before the crisis. And in fact, if you have a system in which no one gets an absolute majority, parties tend to be more likely to come to an agreement out of fear of voters switching to opposition parties. This is especially true when you have a system of many small parties. For some parties in the Netherlands, it's very rare to be in government. For them, being in a coalition may be almost a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity, so that might motivate them to keep it stable by compromising and accepting some policies they don't agree with. A good tactic for smaller parties might be to focus on three or four of your key issues and make sure that those issues are agreed upon in a way that's favourable to your party. They can then present this as a real achievement to their voters, and present themselves as a feasible option for getting policy enacted. In this case, larger parties don't want to lose control by having to go through new elections, in which voters might blame them for causing instability, and having to renegotiate everything from scratch. That way, power between parties sort of balances out, with everyone incentivized to remain aligned and maintain the coalition. Also, it's important to remember that the problem with coalitions in countries with loads of small parties isn't perhaps so much keeping the coalition alive, but forming it in the first place. Negotiations tend to be very long in these countries, which is indeed a problem, but lengthy negotiations could benefit long-term stability, as parties will want to avoid going through this rigmarole again if the coalition collapses, and therefore they'll make agreements very carefully. This might be another explanation as to why coalitions on the continent tend to survive. From the start, parties ensure their interests are aligned to keep the coalition alive. Therefore, collapse tends to occur due to unforeseen circumstances, not because it was doomed to from the beginning. Hopefully, we've given you some insights as to how coalitions can be made to work, and what conditions are necessary to have a system with good coalitions that don't collapse every year either system can be made to work. Whether your system gets coalitions, and whether they're stable, seems not to be so much a choice as rather a consequence of other choices, like your electoral system. But that system is very much based on political culture and what you want a government to do. If you want those in power to be able to govern the country in a way they themselves think is best, and want to relieve them from obstacles, then you'll want to make sure that your system creates parties large enough to get absolute majorities. Otherwise, if countries are just short of that, then you'll tend to get a bunch of bad coalitions. 
Alternatively, if you want people in power to have to cooperate, even with other parties, rather than fight because you think this moderates the powerful, and in the long term prevents politics from swinging left to right in every election round, then you want to make sure that your system facilitates medium to small sized parties, so that no one can make tactical moves and make coalitions collapse. But what do you think? Would your country be better off with an absolute majority government or a coalition? Let us know your thoughts in the comments below. Before we go, and as I said at the start, using code ELECTION gets you 15% off the pin badges in our merch store. These are our Countries with Shoes pin badges, based on our iconic designs, and we've made one for every EU country and a bunch of others. So if you want to support your country, show the places you've visited, or just help the channel make more independent, impartial content, then check out the store. It's linked down below. Also, be sure to subscribe to the channel and hit the bell icon to be notified every time we release a new video. Special thanks to our Patreon backers who make videos like this one possible. And if you want to see your name at the end of videos, then you too can back us on Patreon. The link to that is in the description.